This is uh, question three from the January 2011 BY1 paper. Um, question three here is uh, is a big question. Okay, uh, it's worth 14 marks in total. And uh, it's all to do with uh, membrane transport. Um, but it starts off by looking at osmosis and then moves on uh, later to uh, active transport. Okay, uh, so you've really got to concentrate uh, hard on this question because uh, it does change from one mechanism to another plus as well the question is quite technically difficult okay um, so let me read out the uh, the question then an investigation was carried out in which red blood cells were placed in salt solutions of different concentrations okay so it's osmosis uh, in animal cells okay not plant cells so you need to uh, obviously pick up on that because uh, uh, there's uh, different things you need to consider for osmosis in animal and plant cells. Okay, um, the percentage of cells destroyed by bursting, which is called hemolysis, was recorded and the results shown in the graph below. All right, now, uh, got to be honest with you, um, this uh, parts of this question uh, certainly the graph um, has been used in uh, an OCR paper many, many years ago. All right. Um, uh, which which the Welsh Joint uh, do from time to time. They seem to use questions from uh, other exam boards. Um, anyway, I, uh, I want to take you through this graph really before we go uh, any further. OK, um, I can just about fit the graph into the uh, the screen there. All right. Uh, along the Y axis, you've got red blood cells destroyed by hemolysis uh, quoted as a percent. OK, so that's the units that's being used um, along the X axis. Uh, you can see the values. Uh, you can't see the label, but but it's actually concentration of uh, sodium chloride, uh, which is salt. Um, there it is, salt concentration, grams per decimeter cubed. Right, so let's uh, get this graph back into shot, okay, because I want to be able to uh, draw some stuff on here now. Right, um, I want to explain what's going on with this graph, because um, uh, if you can't understand the graph, you're going to have trouble uh, with the question. OK, so basically now from um, zero salt concentration uh, to um, around about three, just after three, what you've got is 100 percent hemolysis of the red blood cells. OK, so I've just drawn a red line there. Uh, to show you that just after three uh, grams per decimeter cube salt concentration, um, you have a hundred percent of your red blood cells destroyed. They've all gone. All right, they've all undergone hemolysis. So what you should be able to interpret from that little bit of information is this: red blood cells are burst, yeah, but that means the salt solution that they have been submerged in is hypotonic. Because remember, a hypotonic solution has a higher water potential than the red blood cells. So that means water will move into the red blood cell and cause them to burst. All right. Uh, so that, I think, is something that you just need to be able to figure out, really, OK, that if you've got 100 percent hemolysis, the solution is hypotonic. All right. Now, as you increase the concentration of the salt solution, what's happening is the um, percentage hemolysis is actually decreasing until it eventually reaches zero. All right. So as the curve of the line goes down, there's less and less hemolysis occurring. So what it's telling you is this. Um, as the salt concentration increases, 
it gradually becomes more and more hypotonic. All right, until eventually when you get down to uh, just after uh, four and a half grams per decimeter cubed of salt, basically you've got zero hemolysis. That means the cells are definitely in a hypertonic solution. All right, because there's no more hemolysis. So there's no more water entering the red blood cells. OK, so what must be happening after uh, four and a half uh, grams per decimeter cubed salt concentration is um, the water must be leaving the red blood cell. So they're actually going to be uh, become uh, crinkled and shriveled at these high salt concentrations. OK, um, so I think there's uh, several facts to keep in mind about this graph. Uh, and just to, just to know what solutions are hypotonic and which ones are hypertonic. And uh, once, once you're settled with that, then I think uh, uh, you can tackle the questions that follow uh, relatively easily. OK, so uh, let's move on then to uh, the first question. Um, number one. OK, it's, uh, it says explain in terms of water potential why red blood cells burst when placed in a solution that has a lower concentration uh, than the plasma. Now, if you're not sure what plasma is, it's the fluid part of the blood. It's what the uh, red blood cells actually uh, float in. OK, um, so in this uh, in this example now, you've got to appreciate that the, the examiner is using uh, both the term water potential and lower concentration, okay, uh, for the plasma. Just just remember that when the examiner is talking about lower concentration in an osmosis question, he's actually referring to a solution with a um, high water potential, okay. So. Any solution with a low concentration of uh, dissolved substances, okay, has a high water potential, all right? So remember, the technical term for a low concentration solution is hypotonic, okay? Hypo is relating to the concentration of dissolved substances, hypo meaning low. Okay, right, so um, basically then, if the plasma has a lower concentration of dissolved substances, as I've said, it's got a higher water potential compared to the inside of the uh, red blood cell. All right, so water will move into the red blood cell by osmosis. You must state by osmosis, okay, and also state that the water moves down uh, the water potential uh, gradient. Okay, so that's explained uh, the movement of water in terms of water potential. Okay, um, but we haven't addressed the issue of why the red blood cell bursts. Okay, because that is also in the question and lots of people forget um, about including that in their answer. All right. Uh, red blood cells burst, um, uh, like like all animal cells, when water en enters them, uh, because they don't have any cell wall. Okay, so uh, all they have is a cell membrane, and the cell membrane is not able to withstand uh, the increase in pressure that's generated when water enters the cell. Okay, and that's why they burst. OK, so uh, there's my answer. I've said that there is a higher water potential outside the red blood cell compared to inside the red blood cell. Water will then move into the red blood cell by osmosis down a water potential gradient. OK, um, so important there, water potential gradient. Um, water will move in by osmosis. OK, and there is a higher water potential outside the red blood cell. OK. Uh, then I've addressed the issue of the red blood cell bursting. I've just said that the, it only has a cell membrane 
which cannot withstand the pressure generated by the water entering the cell. Uh, I could have put in there lastly that the red blood cell has no cell wall, um, but uh, I just decided to say uh, the cell membrane cannot withstand the pressure. Okay, so that's uh, part uh, one done. Now, uh, part two uh, and part three is, uh, is relating to the graph a bit more. It's asking you now to state the salt concentration at which the number of cells hemolyzed is equal to that not hemolyzed. Okay, so let's scroll up to the graph. Okay, if I can get it all in shot. There you go. So uh, we want the salt concentration now that will give the same number of hemolyzed cells as the same number of non-hemolyzed cells. So that sounds very, very much to me like 50-50. Uh, so what we're looking at here is basically 50%. All right, 50% are hemolyzed, 50% are not. So what we do is that we um, draw a line from 50%, okay, right across to the curve, okay. Now you need to do this as accurately as you can in an exam. You certainly need to use a ruler. Uh, use a pencil, all right, because if you make a mistake, you can rub it out. Um, and lastly, then we need to draw a line uh, down from the um, y-axis if I just redraw this line in okay so we now need to draw a line down from the y-axis um, down to the uh, x-axis okay all right that's a, that's reasonable okay so just to uh, summarize I've drawn a line from 50% on the y-axis across to the curve and then I've drawn a line down then to uh, the x-axis. And that now has given me um, a reading of uh, 4 grams per decimeter cubed. All right, so that's the concentration of salt that will give us 50% hemolyzed and 50% normal uh, red blood cells. Okay, uh, as with any question where you have to quote a value, uh, you do need to put in the um, units, okay? So I've got there 4 grams per decimeter cubed. If you don't put the units in, you won't get the mark. Okay then, uh, let's look at uh, part uh, 3. Uh, the graph shows that hemolysis occurs between 3.3 uh, and 4.7 grams per decimeter cubed salt concentration uh, suggest why there is a range okay so let's uh, scroll back up to the graph all right what that question is relating to of course is this part of the graph here that curve going down why doesn't the red blood cells um, drop in one go why do you have this slight different range of salt concentrations well the answer is a little bit tricky to be quite honest all right um again looking at the question it's it's a suggest question and uh i, I can i can be confident that uh, perhaps uh, in your lessons this really hasn't been tackled okay um and you've just got to give uh, your best go at giving a reasonable suggestion to uh, why there is a range um, that shows hemolysis okay uh, one would expect that you'd have a one great big drop down from a hundred percent to zero so if i just scroll back up to the graph if I just draw uh, a line in, uh, why doesn't the uh, hemolysis values drop in one big go like that? Okay, uh, why does it uh, have a range of salt concentrations? Okay, 
Well, uh, this this is this is quite difficult to get, and I think uh, you either know this or you don't, uh, or you'd have to have a good guess uh, at it. Uh, basically, what it's suggesting is that um, each red blood cell will have a different uh, concentration of substances inside it. Okay, which means each red blood cell will have a slightly different uh, water potential. Okay, so if you've got a situation where a cell has different water potentials, then it's going to take different salt concentrations to cause hemolysis. All right, um, so for example, uh, it's all to do with uh, water potential gradients. Okay, um, if you've got um, uh, a, a big or steep water potential gradient, okay, uh, then water will actually move in um, a lot faster, okay. So uh, it's a difficult, uh, difficult question um, to tackle, I think. Um, but uh, once you've been made aware of this sort of idea that red blood cells can have different concentration of solutes inside them, uh, compared to the surrounding solution. Uh, it then becomes obvious then that you have different water potential gradients and uh, it takes different amounts of water to enter uh, the cell to cause uh, hemolysis. Okay, so I've typed in my answer there. I've just said each red blood cell has different water potentials um, inside them and so this means they require different water potentials in the external solution that's just the solution that the the cells are, are surrounded by uh, to cause uh, bursting of the cell all right a uh, little bit awkward question there but uh, hopefully uh, you were following uh, my logic on that one okay then uh, moving on to part b Okay, now this uh, this is where the question changes really uh, from osmosis uh, to active transport. So I want to explain how I know it's active transport. All right, so uh, this is what the question states. An investigation was carried out on the uptake of potassium ions by root tissues. Okay, uh, so you've got potassium ions there. Okay. Um, so instantly, you know it's you now know it's no longer osmosis because we're talking about potassium ions. All right, um, osmosis is only the movement of water. Okay, um, so at the moment, I know it's not osmosis, but I don't know that it's active transport at the moment. So let's read on. Uh, the root was cut into four discs of uniform size and each disc was added to an equal volume of a solution containing a fixed uh, potassium ion concentration. Okay. The experiment was carried out in different oxygen concentrations and there's my first clue that it's active transport. Okay. Active transport requires energy in the form of ATP. And in order to make ATP, you need oxygen uh, for respiration to occur, aerobic respiration, of course. All right. Um, so uh, if we look at the table of results, OK, you've got oxygen concentration in arbitrary units. It goes from 0, then 4, 11 and 20. And there we have uh, the rate of potassium ion uptake, again, in arbitrary units. It goes 7, 27, 92, 100. OK, uh, so I'm pretty confident now that this is all to do with active transport. All right. It hasn't mentioned energy yet. Uh, it hasn't mentioned anything about uh, gradients. All right. But, um, you know, at this moment is a good guess that it's uh, actually active transport. OK, uh, part one then. State with a reason one other variable that should be kept uh, constant. All right. So um, the the examiner has told you that the, the disks were cut in a uniform size and they were added to equal volumes of a solution. All right. So what he's done there is he stated some variables that he's uh, 
uh, controlling. Um, so you need to put in now some other uh, variables that you need to keep uh, constant. Now, based on the on the fact now we think that that this is active transport, which requires energy, another variable to keep constant would be temperature. All right, because the um, synthesis of ATP via aerobic respiration requires enzymes. All right, and enzymes can be affected by um, temperature. Okay, so you don't want to have a situation where uh, one tube is uh, at a higher temperature because that means there's potentially more ATP in that tube and that really won't produce um, reliable uh, results at all. Um, the other thing of course you could keep constant is pH that affects enzyme activity okay um, so uh, two uh, two variables that we could have put in there uh, there are others okay but that will do okay then so uh, the uh, factor that uh, I've mentioned is temperature uh, that must be kept constant okay and the reason I've given because you, you you are asked to give a reason so you get one mark for stating uh, the variable temperature in this case the reason then is to state that the temperature would affect enzyme activity during aerobic respiration and then affect the level of ATP produced all right so I have stated the variable and given a reason why it must remain uh, uh, constant right moving on then part two using the information in the table so you need to refer back up to this table here okay um, state with an explanation the main method by which potassium ions are taken into the root right so I've already discussed this previously um, it's active transport simple as that uh, the reason being that uh, active transport requires ATP okay and in order to make ATP you need oxygen so that aerobic respiration uh, can occur and uh, you can quite clearly see in the table that as you increase the oxygen concentration you do indeed increase the rate of potassium ion uptake so I think that all fits in nicely active transport because uh, it requires ATP and to make ATP you need uh, oxygen okay so that's my answer I've stated it's active transport uh, because this requires ATP okay uh, that will get you two marks okay active transport obviously because you've stated the the main method which is active transport uh, next uh, it requires ATP then I've said ATP is synthesized during aerobic respiration now don't just put respiration in there because there are two types of respiration uh, this is the respiration that requires oxygen um, and it's oxygen that's important for this question okay um, so uh, aerobic respiration then and lastly, I've just said from the table, the rate of potassium ion uptake increases with increase in oxygen concentration. So it's just adding some evidence there uh, to support uh, your statement of it being uh, active transport. Okay, then. Um, lastly, then, uh, part C, it says state the rate of uptake you would expect if a drop of cyanide solution had been added to each of the four solutions explain your answer okay you do need to know it's in the syllabus you need to know the action of cyanide all right cyanide is known as a respiratory inhibitor all right it can actually prevent the formation and synthesis of ATP all right so ultimately it actually stops or inhibits aerobic respiration okay now just out of interest sake um, cyanide um, is an enzyme inhibitor and it's actually a, a non-competitive inhibitor uh, of an enzyme called cytochrome oxidase okay 
Um, so it completely stops uh, aerobic respiration. It's an extremely poisonous substance and can kill you um, if, uh, if you were unfortunate enough to be contaminated with it. All right. Um, so uh, cyanide is a respiratory inhibitor. It stops and prevents or inhibits uh, aerobic respiration, which means you cannot make ATP. All right. And uh, therefore, active transport should stop. OK, um, but um, let's have a look at uh, another aspect of the question. It wants you to state the rate of uptake you would expect if a drop of cyanide solution had been added. All right. Now, um, this is where people get a little bit confused. All right. Um, people tend to think that the rate of uptake, if cyanide was added, uh, the rate of uptake of potassium would be zero. Well, it isn't. Because in the table, at an oxygen concentration look of zero, the rate of potassium uptake is seven. Now, you may be asking, well, what's that got to do with cyanide? Well, it's got this to do with it, all right? Although that table doesn't have anything to do with, with the results for cyanide, what it is doing is that it is showing you the rate of potassium uptake when there's no oxygen present. So you can assume that there actually could be cyanide added there because that's what cyanide does. It actually prevents uh, cells being able to use oxygen to make ATP. So ultimately, even if oxygen is present, if you've got cyanide present as well, you cannot use the oxygen. All right. So it's like there's no oxygen there. All right. If you get uh, if you get my meaning on that one. OK, so the actual uh, rate of uptake would be seven arbitrary units, not zero. Now, this is where you will get the high marks in these exams. If you can concentrate and pick up on uh, this bits of information in an exam, you really will score highly. And this is where I hope these video tutorials will help, where I'm highlighting the, the important uh, aspects uh, in the question. OK, so we got three marks here. So I'm going to state the rate of uptake as uh, being seven. OK. Um, we need to um, give a reason for that now or explain the answer. So just to uh, remind you, um, cyanide is a respiratory inhibitor. It prevents aerobic respiration. Um, therefore, uh, no oxygen uh, can be used to make uh, ATP. OK, uh, I've typed in an answer there and I just want to uh, discuss it a little bit more because uh, there is a little bit more uh, that we can point out uh, in this question. OK, um, if we move up to um, the table again, um, what I'm interested in now is why there is actually still the uptake of potassium ions when there's no oxygen present. All right. Um, so what could be going on here? Well, the only reasonable explanation to this is that there must be some sort of passive means by which potassium is being taken up uh, by the cells. All right, because remember, a passive process is one that does not require energy. OK, um, so it may be some some form of diffusion, maybe a facilitated diffusion mechanism uh, at play here. All right. Um, but I think it's important to address this uh, this aspect in uh, in your answer, really. OK, so all I've put at the moment is cyanide inhibits aerobic respiration, so preventing the synthesis of ATP. Now I want to address why the rate is seven and not actually zero.
Okay, so uh, I've just added in that last sentence now um, to address the fact that the rate is not zero as there is some passive process involved with potassium uptake uh, into the cells. So that now is a full, thorough answer that uh, should uh, achieve uh, three marks. So let's um, look at the mark scheme uh, quickly. Okay, uh, I don't think there's anything uh, unusual in this mark scheme. Uh, part one they're looking at osmosis okay uh, look at the terms a any term underlined in a mark scheme means that you have to state that word uh, to get the mark okay so if you had just said water moves into the cell you wouldn't have got the mark you had to have said the whole of that statement there water moves in by osmosis all right so uh, that that's uh, part one. Part two, look, reading off on the graph, we got the right answer there, four grams per decimeter cubed with the units. Don't forget the units. Okay. This part three then was the, uh, the, the, the awkward question really asking you about why there is a range of salt concentrations over which hemolysis occurs. And uh, a difficult one. Um, to, to get if you haven't been made aware of it but it's to do with the different water potentials inside uh, the different red blood cells okay um, next question then part B it was asking you about variables you needed to keep constant um, I said temperature you could have had pH um, you needed to give a reason and it was to do with uh, basically enzyme uh, activity uh, where uh, respiration really uh, is controlled by enzymes all right so if you change the enzyme activity you can alter the rate of uh, aerobic respiration and then you can alter um, the uh, amount of ATP made okay if we move down then uh, the other bits now uh, to do with active transport that's the process by which potassium ions enter cells you need to make sure you mention it's uh, ATP dependent and aerobic respiration requires oxygen okay part C then um, you had to have the seven arbitrary units okay uh, you had to have that in if you look at the the asterisk you had to have that in to get the marks okay there's the information about cyanide. It inhibits aerobic respiration. There's the enzyme I mentioned uh, earlier on about cytochrome oxidase. So if you were aware of that, uh, well, you are now. Uh, if you remember it, you could put that in an exam. All right, in the relevant parts. Um, and uh, lastly, then, when no oxygen is present, there is still some uptake. All right, OK. And that there must be by a passive process, possibly uh, diffusion. Okay, a, a pretty a pretty long question. Uh, some some difficult parts in there. Uh, you'd only score highly on this if you have really thoroughly understood your work and f uh, followed uh, the question uh, uh, correctly. Okay, that question. Uh, there are a number of places where, if you weren't quite concentrated, if you didn't quite understand what was in the question, or if you hadn't quite thoroughly revised these uh, membrane transport processes, you may very well have struggled. Okay, so I hope this question has helped highlight how to tackle uh, a difficult question. But of course, you still need to try and revise and understand. Uh, uh, these concepts okay